Hello, uh, my name is Jennifer New. Thank you so much for waiting. We just had a, a little technical backstage difficulty. Um, it's exciting to feel like we're actually maybe like backstage. Uh, and so tonight um, I am here with um, Carrie Shootpels and Shelley Buffalo and also uh, Jason Polios at the Iowa City Public Library who's going to be sort of DJing for us. And before we dive into this conversation tonight, um, first of all, I really wanna thank Jason and the, the library for being such great co-hosts and um, just community partners throughout this year. This is our second to last Oberman conversation of the season. And the last one is on April 7th and it is about neighborhood nests. Uh, which is um, nurturing every student together safely. Uh, this is a wonderful collaboration that came up um, last summer as we, as the community was realizing what schooling would and would not look like this year. And um, uh, leaders from nonprofits, local businesses, local government and the school district all came together to start creating these uh, very small neighborhood um, spaces that would support students in their learning. And so we're gonna hear about not only what's happened this year, but how this model might continue into the future, um, even as schools reopen. So that's April 7th. So tonight um, I am joined by um, Shelly Buffalo, um, who was born near the Meskwaki settlement and much of her extended family still lives in Tama County. Um, her own journey, journey has led her away uh, and back more than a dozen times. So she's kind of a self-described wanderer. She is a trained visual artist who has a long time identification with punk rock, as well as a deep dedication to restoring ancestral foods, including Meskwaki's Tama Flint corn, which I hope she'll tell us about later. Um, and it's Shelley's, uh, Shelley who appears in a lot of the publicity for this event. And, and those were photos that were taken after the derecho last summer. So welcome Shelley. And then Carrie um, Shootpels is an enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. And she is at work on a book tentative, tentatively titled The Indian Card. Carrie is currently a fellow of practice in the UI's Public Policy Center and a fac faculty lecturer in the rhetoric department. She directs the Iowa First Nation Summer Program, an academic camp held at the University of Iowa, and is the vice president of the UI's Native American Council. And from 2000, nine to 2016, she was a homelessness policy advisor in the Obama administration. Carrie is a trained storyteller and teaches digital storytelling at a variety of levels. So welcome both of you. Um, as one thing that we are eventually going to be discussing, and I sense probably is also bringing certain, uh, some, some of our guests here tonight is around the land acknowledgement and Carrie was part of the writing of that. Carrie, could you begin by reading the land acknowledgement? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Chippewa. Oh, sorry. My screen changed. Of the Chippewa, Iowa, Kickapoo, Menominee, Miami, Missouri, Omaha, Osage, Oto, Ottawa, Ponca, Potawatomi, Sac and Fox, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, three affiliated tribes and Winnebago nations. The following tribal nations, Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Ponca tribe of Nebraska, Sac and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Winnebago tribe of Nebraska nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. 
consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, understanding the historical and current experiences of native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment and retention efforts, acknowledging our past, our present and future native nations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Jason, thanks for sharing that. Um, so this um, Oberman conversation, and I should say this series is intended to bring members of um, the community and campus experts together for around shared um, topics of passion and expertise. And I can't think of two better people to bring together than um, Shelly and Carrie, who um, I actually thought knew each other and we were well into a very, very lively conversation of planning this before I realized they had never met. <laughs> so, um, at any rate, um, we, I, I reached out originally to Carrie because of this uh, relatively new land acknowledgement. Carrie, when was it actually, remind me when it was uh, made public? On Indigenous Peoples Day last year, so October of 2020. Okay. And, and knowing that there, were, there was a lot of interest in it and a lot of questions, and then as we began to talk and brought Shelly in as well, what has really um, come about is a conversation about, about belonging. And so um, bear with us, we will get to the land acknowledgement, but um, we're sort of approaching it from a, a broader perspective of what it means to belong to, to a tribe, a nation, to a place, to land. So Carrie, if we could start um, with you and uh, with your book project and the Indian card, and if you can first tell us what is an Indian card and what is your relationship to that specific document? Sure. Um, and I should mention the term the Indian card is my own. So most uh, Native people would probably know it as an enrollment card or some sort of enrollment document. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll just start with how the idea came about, which was, um, I was digging through my old wallet, uh, trying to put my old wallet into my new wallet, as I'm sure many of us have done before and, and out popped all these cards I had hadn't used or seen in, in months. Um, and one of them was my tribal affiliation card. And I sort of took a moment to look at it and noticed that it had an expiration date <laughs> and the expiration date was coming up, uh, you know, it was within a matter of months. And I thought, huh, I wonder what I would need to do to renew this. I, I hadn't really thought that it would expire. And so it, through the process of learning um, about what it was going to take for me personally to renew my enrollment card, uh, it, it, brought up a lot of questions about identity and how do we de define identity? Um, Native people are so used to having to defend their identity. And I think part of that is formalized and institutionalized by this concept of blood quantum and enrollment and certificates <laughs> in a way that people who identify uh, not as native, but as any other group don't have to ever think about, you know, my, my father is German and I have never once had to think about my German enrollment card. Right. And so there's this sense of identity um, that exists for native peoples that goes so far beyond what most Americans will ever have to think about. And I think that there's just something really fascinating about that idea of constantly having to defend and protect your own identity. Um, uh, spoiler alert, I did pass my enrollment uh, test. So I did get my tribal enrollment renewed. Um, but even the process of taking a test <laughs> uh, 
seemed quite strange to me. Um, and that's not a dig on my, my own tribe, which is the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. Every tribe has a different set of parameters under which they define membership. Um, and I think it's kind of fascinating to look across the spectrum of that and think about how do we define identity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of things were on the test? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I can share. I don't think these are national secrets. Um, so a lot of it was place-based, interestingly. And I did not grow up in North Carolina, which is where my tribe is located. And so for me, a lot of it was non-intuitive knowledge. I imagine that someone who grew up in Pembroke, North Carolina, would be able to pass the test very easily. Um, a lot of it was sort of, you know, what are the schools here? What are the churches here? What is the so-and-so and the so-and-so? Um, some of it was historical, uh, naming former tribal chairs. Um, and so it was clear to me that the intentionality was good, mm -hmm. which is, do you have a meaningful connection to not just the place, but the history of the place? Um, I just don't think I ever envisioned having to take a test mm -hmm. <laughs> on such a deeply personal thing. Um, and I think that's a relatively unique concept. Uh, not all, certainly not all tribes have such a test, yeah. uh, but there are different ways that we conceptualize identity in that way too. It's interesting to me, a, f a friend of mine moved to the Netherlands um, like five years ago and, um, and in taking the test to, to stay there, um, there, there are all these lengthy questions and one was along the lines of what would be the appropriate thing to bring as a guest to a neighbor's dinner party. Hmm. And that would then prove how well you knew the culture there. So yeah, so, so these questions of do you belong here are, are, are kind of universal to some extent. Could, could you tell us more about blood quantum and, and where that came from. And, and I do know, as you just alluded to, it's, uh, you know, used differently by different tribes. Blood quantum is one of those unique, you know, it's sort of like in COVID, all of us have suddenly become aware of this term synchronous and asynchronous, right? Um, blood quantum is one of those concepts that almost any native person will know. Um, and I would guess most Native people don't know about. Um, and it's just the idea of how much um, of your blood uh, can you directly trace back to however your tribe in particular defines its own membership criterion. So it's usually when the census first determined um, who was quote unquote Indian, uh, and how much of your bloodline can you trace back to that? So as you can imagine, as people have married non-native people, um, each generation has, you know, divided by half, I suppose, um, each generation has less and less blood quantum. Um, most tribes would consider 25% blood quantum to be part of the enrolled group uh, or membership. Um, but even that is different. You know, there's, there's not really one standard across the board. Some tribes will consider any native blood, <laughs> for example, some won't. So it really depends. I like to always remind people that there are over 550 native tribes in this country, um, and they're all different. And so, um, you know, often what we think of as a monolith is, is quite diverse. So um, Shelly, um, moving, I just wanted to ask you a few questions from this perspective of, um, of the Meskwaki. So I've been listening to interviews, for example, with um, people who are members of coastal tribes where it's a matter of, do I have access to the resources of you know, this certain like fishing area and, um, you know, to, to perhaps up in Alaska to whaling and so on. 
And, and as um, the member of a tribe, when you have then access to its various resources, what does that mean as, as a Meskwaki? You know, so I, and I'm asking that partly be, as, of, as another member of this middle of the country place <laughs> who, um, you know, it's, we're in farming land. And so having access to your community's resources, what does that mean from a Meskwaki perspective? Well, um, first off, Meskwaki, <clears throat> like a lot of folks aren't familiar with the fact that uh, Meskwaki, the, the tribe owns this land. It's, a, it's a right around 8,400 acres presently. Mm -hmm. um, it started with 80, um, and I believe that was 1853 was or it's at 1857, somewhere around there. I'm terrible with numbers sometimes. And um, so they, uh, you know, they purchased those first 80 acres and it's grown since then. Um, and um, so we are a settlement, we are not a reservation. And uh, that has afforded us um, a certain level of autonomy. Um, you know, more so than other tribes. And uh, one of the things, the unique things too, is that a lot of the reservations were, um, and I, I'm trying to remember what year that was, um, where uh, I believe it was the Dawes Act that divided up um, reservations into individual family allotments. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was there was a huge loss of land um, during that allotment period. Um, because the, the you, Dawes Act was 1906. Just oh, I just happened thank you. to read that earlier today. So thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't store it all up here. It's uh, but um, so thank you for chiming in on that. Um, so they uh, anyway, you know, for Meskwakis, our land is communally owned, and that's a really important. Um, and of course we have had, you know, the land is in trust, so it's trust land. Uh, it's really this kind of unique situation, uh, but still we, you know, like I said, that autonomy and, uh, and tribal sovereignty, we've been able to maintain that um, uh, to at least to a, a certain extent since the, the original founding of the settlement. Mm -hmm. um, so that, when it comes to access to the resources though, like the individual um, must go through the tribal council in order to access land. So you right now with um, the tribal housing program, if you are once again to, to be approved for housing, you have to go through um, a, um, a system and then finally have tribal council approval. Um, but then you get a land assignment and it's an average about, you know, it has your house site and it's an average of about two acres. Mm -hmm. um, but like, uh, you know, for somebody like me, who's really interested in farming and grazing, that's, that is a, um, a challenge because like all of the farmland in all of the, the grasslands, you know, the hayland and things like that. Well, that is managed collectively with the tribal council having, you know, the final say on that. Um, and uh, it used to be, uh, a, you know, easier to get a land assignment. Um, families, usually the land assignments would be, you know, just an understanding. Like that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, the Wanity land. And which is on my grandmother's side is the Wanities. And that is the, um, you know, that's the young bears um, over there. And, um, you know, back in the day we had, in addition to our traditional gardens, um, you know, families would have maybe a couple cows and some pigs and, you know, um, raising some animals to supplement, um, you know, uh, well, to be self-sustaining, right? Um, and this would be in my grandparents and great grandparents day. And um, so I'm, I'm digressing, but like now, of course, as, 
as we've moved away from that, um, I guess that local foods model, um, now it's like the concept of, you know, what do you need the land for? Um, it's, that's a big question, you know? Um, and it's like, if you need it for farming, then that farming or that ranching should be done by the tribe as a kind of, and I know this can be taken as a negative word, but um, uh, the tribe, and this is true with most tribes. I, I talked to um, Dan Cornelius, who's with Intertribal Ag, Ag Council, and he, um, we were talking about this. And he's like, well, yeah, a lot of tribes tend to manage their lands. They, they prefer to manage their lands as a monopoly. And when we go back to the Dawes Act, we understand why, right? Because there is a danger in those individual allotments. You know, um, you, we, we know how devastating that was, that land loss through allot allotments. So there is this, you know, I guess, you know, kind of, um, you know, the need to really control, to have that control and to have, you know, a, um, any type of enterprise or any type of, of land use be really like in the collective. Um, does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, and I think, so one question I, I, I have for you is that, you know, given that you've, that, that you're you're from the settlement and and as your bio says you've like moved back and forth and and mm -hmm. I sense that you have this kind of agricultural heart so what what really at this point and I know I think you're you're maybe going to be working with seed savers soon if you can help us to understand your relationship to the land and the returning to it and why it is important to you to have access or other um, small scale um, native farmers to have that access that can be very difficult to get. It is, and it's, you know, and, and each tribe is gonna have, you know, um, it's, it's always complicated. I mean, we have, um, you know, each tribe is gonna have a little bit different, um, approach to it and as well as different situations. Um, but yeah, my heart, you know, I've, um, you know, I've been dreaming of really living on the land and I mean like producing food from the land and, and being able to, you know, um, be a part of the local food system. I, I, I'm old enough to, I guess, as, as a small child experience the tail end of local foods um, you know, I, I was a child during the farm crisis. So that really changed dramatically, um, during my young years. And so, you know, I, I still have an attachment of that and, and to that. And I, and I feel, um, you know, it's just something that I gravitate towards. Um, and I guess like the challenge is, is that, so, uh, let me try to, you know, the challenge is, is like, first off, okay, we're in middle of Tama County, Iowa. It's in middle of rural Iowa. So just in general terms, trying to get folks on board with, um, you know, regenerative agriculture, um, local food systems, um, you know, holistic grazing, um, you know, all of this terminology and all of this new stuff that's actually old because what we're, what it's all based on, it's, it's just based on uh, working with the, the, the ecology, you know, just, just the ecology and, and trying to grow food in a way that, that um, works with that and replicates that as much as possible. Right. Um, but this is, so this isn't new, it's old, but it's new again. And so since it's, these concepts are so new and stuff, it's, it's, it takes time for communities to embrace them. It really takes time. So it's not just like one person like me with, with a bunch of ideas and inspiration is going to change things overnight. That's just not going to happen. Um, right now the tribe is looking to, um, 
take all of their tillable acres out of production because it was monocropping with, um, you know, the chemical management GMO crop, you know, that, that typical GMO monocropping system. Mm -hmm. And they're taking all of that out. And um, I I think pretty, you know, the last time that I heard, um, they're planning on putting it into CRP. Right. Um, like for me, who's really into like, you know, um, regenerative agriculture, I'm like, well, that's an old technology, but at the same time, that doesn't mean it's bad, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's an old technology of, um, stewarding the land in a more responsible way. Um, and and can you just briefly translate CRP? CRP is, no, I can't. What is CRP? Uh, conservation what is it, Jennifer? <laughs> Re- renewal and preservation. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it's, uh, so it's, yeah, um, you know, uh, basically it's planting it back to prairie. Okay. You know, and resting the land, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, and I don't know if you can do it with um, um, forestry too, if you can plant it to trees or not. Um, I've just seen folks, you know, plant it to prairie and thank you. um, Yeah. Conservation reserve programming. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. (laughs) And, and before we move on, I mean, I think we can talk in the question section a little bit more about agriculture, but, but can you talk specifically about um, Tama Flint corn and, and just tell us about that? Sure. So Tama Flint corn, well, Tama Flint is the common name for our Meskwaki corn. And um, so we have had this seed uh, for easily over 3000 years. And uh, it's, it's one of the seeds that Meskwakis have kept. Um, You know, we have, I've been involved with some seed rematriation projects that have brought some seeds back to the community. But this, this seed, this team of Flint corn, you know, we never went out of practice. So we have been growing this seed out every year for over 3000 years. And it is a, um, there is like a couple of different ways that, that we um, process the corn. We, we pick green corn and process it one way. We also allow the corn to mature and then we, let it dry for seed and but we also use that corn as a food source so we have a few different ways of processing it and then um, preparing it for food and um, it's really just vital and to our tribes um, you know spiritual life um, and of course you know our our connection to our ancestors and it's vital to our nutritional health too. You know, we've had um, one of the indigenous chefs that had come down to help us with some community meals here. She put it this way is that we have cell memory for this food. Mm. You know, you, we have this real thousand relationship um, spiritually and um, you know, the stewardship of it as well as like nutritionally. So it's a cell memory. Um, you know, we have this genetic relationship with this, this corn. And, um, you know, here, uh, even even now, in 2021, Meskwakis still measure their wealth uh, by, you know, how much corn that they um, were able to grow and process and and put, you know, put away for the year. Mm -hmm. You know, we're still, um, we, we still, yeah, really, you know, when I told my aunt that I have plenty of corn and, and don't hesitate to ask, she was just like, well, don't tell anybody else, like, you know, cause you're my, you know, um, you're my main supplier, you know, you're my go-to. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and part of what I so appreciate about that is as we think about land acknowledgement. I I feel like, you know, so much when I hear the land acknowledgements and we've, I think many of us have started hearing these on a regular basis when we're attending various Zoom meetings with people all um, over the country. And 
uh, I always hear them very much as this list of people. And yet it's so interesting to, you know, it's a land acknowledgement. And Shelley, what you're sharing right there is so much, I mean, this 3000 year relationship with the specific seed that is planted in the land, you know? So it, so bringing us back to the land, I, I, I really appreciate, um, yeah, that, that connection. Um, Carrie, could you just tell us a little bit about the land acknowledgement process? Like when did the Native American Council begin this journey? I can try. Um, I It actually precedes me. Uh, so I came to the University of Iowa in 2018 and the process was already underway. Um, so it was a years long process. Part of that I think was, um, you know, what was really important to our leaders here in the native community at the University of Iowa was the consultation process uh, and reaching out to the native communities that have a, a stake in this, right? I mean, from the land acknowledgement itself. Um, and so making sure that, that the verbiage was the way that we wanted it, but also making sure that it fit the needs of, of all of the communities that we were um, consulting with. So it, it took a while. Um, I mean, we, we worked on it for a couple of years after I got here and then it was released uh, this past October uh, on Indigenous Peoples Day. And so, you know, it's, what we like to say is that it's a working document, right? I mean, it, it's very possible that it changes and evolves. Um, acknowledging that, uh, you know, I think that sometimes um, as a Native person, it's easy to feel relegated to the past. You know, there's this like antiquated sense, mm -hmm. um, culturally speaking, but it's so important for people to remember that there are native people here today, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a, it's alive and, and well and present. Um, and just like that, the land acknowledgement is alive and you know, it's, it's a living and breathing document. Well, and within that, like as we were talking about it, you noted how um, many of those listed in the document no longer are located in, in Iowa. Yeah, so there are 67 yeah. tribes that are part of this group that we call the Iowa First Nations. Um, and those would be tribal communities that have at one point called Iowa home or had uh, some meaningful connection to the state. 67 probably sounds like a lot. <laughs> uh, and it is a lot. Um, and, and so I think that that number always really surprises people when they hear it. Um, the the tribes and communities that are named in the document clearly we're not naming 67 um but what was particularly important to us was the consultation with the communities that either are still in iowa or have trust lands still in iowa um of which there are four of those mm -hmm. and and i believe am i right that three of the four it's their trust land is in the form of a casino is that that's the land, right? So that they have a casino that sits on the trust land. Okay. Um, it's communities that are kind of right on the border of Iowa. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably a product of uh, state borders are in some ways um, not that meaningful <laughs> when you're really stopped to think about it. And so you have communities who, tribal communities that are, you know, aren't defined to one particular United States. Um, and so if you look at a map of, of where those communities are, you'll notice that they're, they tend to be right on the, the border. Right. Okay. Um, and as we were talking about this one question that came up that I thought was really interesting was both of you noting uh, with regard to land acknowledgements of who are they for? And I, I I'm curious if you might both, um, reflect on that. Uh, who, who, who are they for? And, and what does that question even mean? 
I would love to share that one of my favorite pre-conversations we have was had was when Shelly and I both tried to remember the first time we had heard a land acknowledgement. Um, the first time I heard one was at the Rhetoric Society of America conference at the University of Maryland, which is about as academic as you can get. Um, and it was about three years ago. So, you know, the concept itself is not an ages old concept of, of land acknowledgement in that way. Of course, tribes and communities have been acknowledging the land forever. Um, but in terms of having sort of a written document that starts a meeting or a conference, I think that that idea is somewhat new. Um, <laughs> and I, I personally really wrestle with it, to be honest. I think that um, what we always try to communicate from our native community here at the University of Iowa uh, and the Native American Council is that a land acknowledgement is is good, um, and it's a step in a process. It, it's part of a larger puzzle, and so the hope and the suggestion is that a land acknowledgement not be the only way that you're engaging with issues of uh, Native sovereignty and Indigenous rights. Um, I mean, the hope is that you're. <laughs> You're exploring uh, these issues in a lot of different ways. My fear is that the land acknowledgement becomes an end point rather than an opening to a conversation. What's been really interesting is the amount of people and organizations that want to talk about the land acknowledgement. I've been trying to use that as my foot into the door to bust the door open and say, while we're here, <laughs> let's talk about how we get more native students to the university, right? Let's talk about, you know, let's talk about all of these other issues that every day we're talking about in our small native community um, that we would hope uh, we could sort of increase the amount of allies for. Shelly? You. Sure. I'm sorry. I was just taking it all in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you, Carrie. Um, yeah. I, it's funny because it was about, <laughs> it's like Carrie, it was about three years ago when I first heard about land acknowledgement and it was, I had um, taken the place of somebody else that was asked to do the land acknowledgement for WFAN um, which is um, Women, Food, and Agriculture Network for their annual conference. And um, that young lady was, was leaving the position that I was coming into. And so she, um, she said, hey, you go do it. You'll be great. <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, I did it. And I didn't know what a land acknowledgement was until way after, actually. So what I, what I, you know, the opening kind of opening the conference, like what I talked about was very different from a land acknowledgement. And, um, and it was uh, one of my coworkers was there and Reagan, and I guess Reagan was just kind of um, tickled by the whole thing. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, it's like land acknowledgement is a, like Carrie said, it's, it's a good starting point but you know organizations um that open with that also really need to understand that that's that it's it's a start that it is not something that you know is really holistically addressing um the issues at hand and representation and inclusion of indigenous peoples um, and especially the, the representation, because like, um, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, you know, to make sure that, that, you know, these organizations that are, are seeking to be allies and, and that are on their own, you know, really doing some great work, but that kind of have this, um, have this uh, blind side, right? Um, and the land acknowledgement can kind of like 
make that blind side worse because they're, they do it and they're like, okay, we did it. So we, we can feel good about that and move on with just our agenda and not, you know, and, and maybe assume that that was inclusive enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think we could start to take some questions from the audience um, as, as we come into the final like 15 minutes or so. Um, what, an interesting question here, and, and I actually via Carrie listened to a really great podcast about blood quantum. So this question pertains to that. Um, and I think it was uh, the NPR code switch. So if you just Google code switch blood quantum, this, this brief podcast comes up that's, that relates to this question, which is, does the blood quantum discourage people from marrying outside of their Native American heritage? I read the question and I've had, you know, a few seconds to ponder it. And the first thing that came to mind was, I imagine in a lot of communities, native and otherwise, there's pressure to marry someone who looks like you. Um, I think the difference in the native community perhaps is that there is this like formal institutional notion of identity that comes along with that. Um, and there are ramifications for it in a way that feel very formalized. I don't think that probably answers the question in, in totality. Um, I have not had the experience, so I certainly can't speak from lived experience, but I'm certain that yes, it probably has um, discouraged people from, from marrying outside of the Native American community, which I think happens all the time in every community. Um, I think the difference is that there is this like thing, you know, there's this like paper thing. <laughs> exists. Yeah. And within that podcast, for example, it begins with somebody who is looking for, um, for a donor, a sperm donor, um, who is going to have a child on her own and needs somebody with a certain percentage <laughs> in order for her child to be then considered part of the tribe. And, you know, she likens it to like, well, if you were having a child with somebody from a different country and somehow could not have, uh, they could not have citizenship in, in the United States, you know, like it, it, you know, it's very much a citizenship question. So it was, it was very interesting. Yeah. Um, and it, but I, if I can chime in on that too, like definitely at, at Meskwaki, I mean, I've, um, it's, <laughs> um, I've taken a break from Facebook for that reason. Uh, because like in our, some of our, tribal forums, there's a lot of conversation about that. And sometimes it's really, you know, like often for me, it's upsetting um, because like our here at Meskwaki, it's enrollment is only on the father's side. So um, my father's Meskwaki and my mother is not, but I'm enrolled. Um, and then I, you know, on my paperwork, I am um, listed as 50% blood quantum. Um, there are folks who are three quarter percent blood quantum Meskwaki, but it's flipped where their mother is, um, their mother is the one who's enrolled and their dad is half, but half on his mother's side, not his father's side. And so like their children aren't enrolled. Like their children that have more, you know, what we call blood quantum um, than me can't be enrolled. And so it's, um, you know, it's young women are reminded, like, be careful of who you choose, because like, depending on who you choose for your partner um, means uh, whether or not that you, you know, we're talking about land access and access to resources, housing, all of that stuff you know, then that's, that's where the line is drawn. So that definitely, um, that, def oh, yes, yes, that's a good question. It definitely uh, uh, puts a lot of pressure 
um, and for Meskwakis, especially on the young women and their mm-hmm. choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, uh, the way that paternal or maternal lineage comes into that is a very interesting issue as, as the mother of two kids who are Jewish on their father's side, but not recognized as Jewish because I'm not Jewish, you know? So, so yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, a question uh, from Chuck Connerly is should Native Americans who have been in Iowa, such as the Iowa or, or who cur- are currently in Iowa be eligible for naming rights for the use of names like Iowa or Hawkeyes? Well, Carrie, you want to take that one? I'm not, I'm naming rights. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I know Chuck. Uh, so Chuck, okay. I will say to you, I don't know really what you mean by that. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure what naming rights means. Does that mean that you would profit off of the name Iowa or like a trademark around the university? I'm, yeah, I'm not sure either. That's kind of what it sounds like that. I mean, that's my sense of naming rights from other uses of it in a more capitalistic kind of way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we could, we could go down a rabbit hole here. I'm currently um, in a little bit of a (laughs) Facebook battle with a company that's called native and they sell deodorant. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and they have no meaningful connection to a native community. I mean, <laughs> there are so, it's just a microcosm. There are so many uh, things you could think about in that space, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, and yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Carrie, because that definitely, I have seen that, whether it's, um, there are some companies, I think Kickapoo Coffee did change their name. They changed their and name. Yeah. yeah, they did. Um, because, and they just, they did it understanding that, you know, they're, that they didn't have rights to name their coffee company that. Um, and I think that's out of Iroquois, Wisconsin, Kickapoo Coffee. Yeah, they think? call it, they're called Wonder State now. I think. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, but yeah, um, I, yeah, that native deodorant and um, different lines, different product lines like that, that are capitalizing. It's funny, like um, uh, when um, Standing Rock, um, became finally became national news, right? Um, I saw like um, when I was going to JC Penny to get uh, something for my kid, uh, we saw all these t-shirts that had kind of ripoffs from the Standing Rock. Um, uh, some of the artists, you know, the t-shirt and apparel lines that came out of um, Standing Rock artists who were trying to raise money for the movement, right? And then it was, um, it was, uh, uh, repeated and put on t-shirts and stuff and native and, uh, or all this other stuff from JC Penney. So even Iowa has a, um, it'll, the outline of the state and it says native on it. Right. And I've, I've yeah. always been troubled and bothered by that. Um, oh. but it's like, um, you know, they, because, you know, the, it's definitely, it's branding, it's marketing and somebody, and it's monetized, somebody is profiting off of it. And it is problematic, but like, can Carrie and I police that? Like, you know, we're good. <laughs> if um, only, <laughs> Shelley. If only that power. Um, uh, from Lucy Lorian, um, I, I, I don't mean to be just totally choosing everybody from um, the, the urban and regional planning, but would it be appropriate to think of quantum and IDs, tests, et cetera, as white concepts used as devices to protect against whites who may want to claim native resources? So the concept is colonial in nature, right? I mean, that's where it came from. So certainly, yes. Um, it, it just depends. <laughs> um, is every community that's using blood quantum doing it out of a protection in that way? Probably not, but um, I think it probably just depends on the community you're talking about. Uh, you know, I think what's really interesting, and I'll go back to the podcast that I shared with Jen, is this idea of what would you do if it wasn't blood quantum? right? Like how would you measure or 
attribute identity. Um, and I think that those are really interesting ideas. The challenge here is that the elephant in the room is that blood quantum and all of the things that Shelley just talked about in the Meskwaki community, it's important not just for your sense of belonging and identity, it's important because often there are really real and meaningful things attached to it, like resources, like land rights, <laughs> like money, like, you know, uh, housing, housing. <laughs> yeah. And so that becomes the real crux here is that when you're attaching some, some resource, some like real resource to this identity of how much blood quantum do you have, it's bound to get messy. And I think there probably is a better way, but unfortunately that's the system that was set up when um, native nations and tribes were stripped of their sovereignty and land. <laughs> it's that here, here is, here are some resources we, the government will give you in small, small quantities, and you have to somehow determine how you're going to allocate them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a more agricultural based question from Diane Platt. Um, and, and this actually gets to something I'd wanted to ask you about, Shelley, is that there are a, a few different I, um, farms at um, the settlement, I, I believe. I think there, there's maybe a, a larger one, Red Earth Gardens, is that the, and then maybe a, one that is um, an elders. It, it, you can correct me, but her question is, she's curious to know more about Red Earth Gardens. Um, your work with Seed Savers Exchange and rematriating seeds. Um, could you speak about food sovereignty initiatives in Iowa? Okay, so, um, well, first off, Red Earth Gardens is a um, tribally owned and run enterprise, and it is um, a vegetable, organic vegetable production farm. So, um, you could compare it to, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of the ones down in Grinnell. Um, like there's, we have so many local vegetable, organic vegetable production farms. Like, um, sorry, I'm just not thinking of any names right now, even though I've been to these farms before. But um, so Red Earth Gardens does not, um, uh, you know, grow like the tame of flint corn and um you know they do grow like a uh, squash and pumpkin varieties and um they were doing beans they're not you know uh, they're not doing beans right now um it just kind of that shifts as far as like uh you know what the community really wants from them um they were especially especially successful with the chickens and providing pasture raised eggs um to the community through those chickens but derecho pretty much wipe that out. So they're rebuilding. Um, they're also, uh, Red Earth Gardens also has a relationship with the casino. So the casinos takes a certain percentage of the, the greens, for example, um, grown at Red Earth Gardens and Red Earth Gardens takes um, the compost from the casino. And they're currently working on building a, um, a composting operation. Um, so, but all of this is like the, Food, the Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiative was started in 2012. So it, it is a very new program. It's not, you know, and um, it's, it's still evolving and developing. So Red Earth Gardens came out of Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiative, but now Red Earth Gardens is, it's still within a department, but it's um, its, its own en entity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, but MFSI, um, Meskwaki Food Sovereignty Initiative, um, the main focus of that program is ancestral foods. So our corn, our beans, our squash, and then there's, there's other, other foods in there, which includes hunting, fishing, foraging, our medicinals. Um, you know, it's not just corn, beans, and squash, but that's, the main ones that, that we grow. And so that's the program that has partnerships with um, 
the Chicago Field Museum in a, it's a seed rematriation partnership, as well as Seed Savers Exchange, um, ISKN, which is Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, and then uh, NAFC, which is Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. Sorry, there's just a lot of, and I hope I got all those right, but um, ISKN has been, um, and, and especially Rowan White has been the person that has um, facilitated the f- seed rematriation um, through Seed Savers Exchange, and not just with Meskwaki, but with um, uh, tribes across the nation. So I have, um, I just got back home uh, this afternoon and um, I was up in the Decorah area um, visiting farms, meeting people and stuff. And so I took um, a bunch of squash with me, uh, winter squash. And uh, because I really love this variety, but it's, um, it's Taos Pueblo Hubbard squash. And I grew it out in my garden um, this last growing season and it did beautifully it's a beautiful keeper, like it's still keeping amazingly and it's delicious. And so I gifted people the squash and, and um, everybody I gave it to, you know, I'm trying to impress upon them how special it is. So it was through Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, it was rematriated to the Taos Pueblo. And um, so, you know, anybody interesting in, in interested in looking that up, just um, you can um, Google Taos Pueblo Hubbard, and then ISKN, and then also Rowan White. If you're interested in seed rematriation, ISKN and Rowan White um, are, you know, that's, that's the organization that she um, stewards, and she has done a ton of work in the area, and she does serve on the board of um, Seed Savers Exchange, too as well as Sean Sherman, who is the sous chef. Um, And um, so there's these, you know, just amazing connections and these networks of people who are, you know, as, as there's so many, you know, we, uh, we really do need to work to get our seeds back. The ones that we have fallen out of practice of using, Um, you know, uh, through so many, um, you know, hundreds of years of, of displacement and, um, you know, loss of our land. Um, we did keep many of our seeds with us, but some of them, you know, and especially those varieties as if you think of like the last 50 years of the 20th century, when, um, the food system really changed from local foods into more of the convenience foods, right? The processed foods, like growing out, five varieties of beans really didn't become practical anymore, but Mm -hmm. that diversity, these are our relatives, you know, and the seeds are, and that, that diversity is really important. Um, because some of these, some of these plants are going to do better in certain seasons than others, because we're faced with climate change right now. And so we're not going to, from season to season, you know, we, we need see more diversity to help um, to be resilient in our food system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one thing I'll also note is Rowan White, which is R-O-W-E-N, I believe. Um, there's a wonderful podcast that, um, actually got me very aware of and interested in seed rematriation, um, with her. And the, the podcast is called For the Wild, and so she was the guest um, sometime this past summer, and it's it's a terrific conversation with her. Um, I, I think we'll do one more question. We started late, so we can. Is that okay, Jason? Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine. There, there's um, understandably kind of questions about that are more or less like perhaps land acknowledgments are a first move and maybe they're not perfect, <laughs> what, what do you both hope might be the next step? And, and I know Carrie, you already mentioned, you know, using that as a way in the door to, but, but are there other ways of, of that maybe kind of formal acknowledging um, 
but that you hope that we might be growing toward? I guess because uh, I've spoken sort of from an institutional perspective and that being the university, I think about this often in, um, from the perspective of students and the university and college. And so I would love to see us make college more accessible to native students. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time maybe not a lot, but we spend time at the university um, reading a land acknowledgement, <laughs> which, is, which is fine. Um, I would love there to be more Native students in the classroom. Um, and there are a lot of barriers that exist uh, to accessing college, uh, university, community college, et cetera. And one of those is of course, tuition. We currently give in-state tuition to any student who's from one of those 67 IO First Nations tribes that I mentioned earlier, which is a good start. Um, it's still expensive and it's not every native student, of course, and there are many um, other factors at play. Uh, and so I think there's a lot that we could do to increase native enrollment, frankly, um, and also increase um, and, and I let's not stop at native enrollment, certainly. I mean, certainly diversity in all its forms. Um, so that's just something I think a lot about. And so the degree to which we can, um, make opportunities more accessible to native people. And in this case, native students, I think is great. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. I'm sorry. I'm taking notes just cause I'm, um, um, as I'm listening to you, I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, one thing about um, universities is that land grant universities now we uh, definitely the research has shown that uh, there are many land grant universities who whose wealth came out of stolen land, right, like directly. And, um, and so that really, you know, when we're talking about the barriers to um, indigenous people in higher education, um, it's like, it, it's, to me, it's a no brainer. It's like, you know, it's, it's time for reparations to be made and in a really meaningful way. And I think the other thing, as far as like with, with um, my passion for, for food and agriculture, local foods, um, you know, what I, what I, um, I hope will, and I, and I know that it's happening because I'm, I'm engaging with people, um, you know, in, in uh, a number of organizations that are making this happen, but that removing the barriers um, um, to, uh, you know, entry level into agriculture, into local foods, um, like real estate prices it, are not going down. Land prices are not going down. Land is, I mean, you know, I, I see these articles about how much land in Iowa Bill Gates owns, you know, we have, we have um, folks that aren't even from this state speculating on land, you know, and that's been going on for a long time. Um, and so, you know, how do we get people who um, indigenous people who are, you know, want to um, live on the land and want to be part of a local food system? You know, how do we help them to get there? Like, um, so there's, all of the organizations and they're really go good organizations out there that I could think that I think really could do um, more as far as the, the inclusion, the representation and the, the, the diligence and the intention of really working towards, um, you know, improving that access. Right. Um, so that's like, um, and, and really being, you know, allies in overcoming those barriers because we're, you know, we're the marginalized within the marginalized here, you know, we're, um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. I could keep talking with both of you for the next hour easily and, and beyond, um, but I really appreciate your time and it's just, it's been a pleasure. So 
Um, thank you. And uh, thank you to our audience for showing up tonight. Um, it was wonderful to have so many people here. And again, Jason, also, I really appreciate your, your help with this. So thank you. Yeah. Good night. All right. Good night, all.